Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It is wonderful to be with you today. Thank you so much for uh, coming early. Thank you so much for putting up with a talk in English first thing in the morning. I hope you all had your coffee. Um, I want to bring you greetings from the land beyond truth. I am from the United States. You may know that in the United States, we are now beyond truth. We have given up on truth. Um, this happened in part because of the presidency of a Mr. Donald Trump from 2016 to 2020. You probably know that President Trump was a legendary liar. What you may not know is that his relationship with truth changed over the course of his presidency. When Trump came into office, he told in public about six lies a day. By the end of his presidency, he was telling 22 lies a day. That's a serious increase, and, and these lies increased in importance. By the time of the end of his presidency, he was telling people that he was still the president, that our elections don't work, that he was in control of the nation. There's something really nice about being beyond truth. So as someone from the land beyond truth, I can confidently tell you that in America, I am very thin, I am in very good shape, and I have all my hair. But for people who are not from the land beyond truth, what has been happening in media is that we have very got, gotten very interested in the process of fact-checking. We are very concerned that in our civic and our political life, that if we lose touch with the truth, that democracy itself will be under threat. And there are moments that this is true. You experienced this in Germany during coronavirus where some people who decided not to be vaccinated, some people who decided that coronavirus was not serious, ended up spreading a great deal of mistruth about the virus. But we also found out something very challenging, which is that fact-checking is hard to do. When people want to believe a particular thing, sometimes giving them the truth doesn't actually make a difference people will pick up whatever truths they find most valuable and most important. And so for people who are in public broadcasting, for people who are in public media, we're at this very strange moment. It feels like what we should be doing is holding on to truth, trying very hard to fight for truth. And what I want to say to you today is I actually think that that is the wrong focus. It is not that I don't believe in truth. It is not that I think that truth is not important. But I actually think there's something that's at least as important. And to explain this to you, I'm going to go back to, at this point, a fairly old book. So this book from Jürgen Habermas, comes out in Germany in 1962. We don't get it in the United States until 1989. Actually, it's a very long time before these ideas make it over into the United States. But when it shows up in the United States, it's like a bomb goes off, right? It's so important. I'm in university at this point. Everybody in university is trying to read this book. Um, even Americans are trying to pronounce the word Öffentlichkeit. Uh, we don't do very well with it, but we try. We're trying to understand this notion of the public sphere. And the reason the public sphere matters is it solves one of the oldest problems in democracy. How do we go from being people around the world who are subjects to a king to people who take care of their own government, who rule themselves. This happens really quickly in societal terms. It's almost overnight. And it's a little bit of a mystery of how it happens. When we go back before about 1700, many people are serfs. 
peasants. They're working in fields. They don't own anything. They're basically in slavery to the people who own the land. And their opinion, if they have it, doesn't matter at all. A small number of people are tradesmen. They're in guilds. They're making leather. They're making paper. They're doing all sorts of things that give them a certain amount of money. And they have power in their own little sectors. But they really have no power over the rulers, the owners of the land. And then something happens. It happens around 1700. And it starts happening that all of these people, all of these tradespeople who are in guilds, all of these people who are professionals, start becoming a public. And they start having the ability to have public opinion. And they have the ability to say, you know what, we don't like what the ruler is doing. We collectively will take our money, we will take our power, and we're going to do things differently. So Habermas says this comes about because of the coffee house. What? The coffee house? The most important political development of hundreds of years is a place where we can go and have coffee? How does this possibly happen? Well, Habermas gives us some clues. Here is the account of someone who has traveled from France and has gone to Oxford in England and is visiting at these coffee houses and says, look, these are not just places to have coffee. These are penny universities. These are universities that are open to anyone who has a little bit of disposable income. There's all manner of news there. You can get news from people. You can do business there. You can talk with people. You can sit by the fire. You can spend time in a public space. And it's that piece of it. It's the public space, the idea that we come together and we talk about what is happening in the world today, and individually and collectively, we make up our minds. We come up with new opinions. We come up with new ways of thinking about the world. That public space, that is what's so valuable in becoming people who can participate in a democracy. I think we have actually sometimes taken the wrong message from this. We tend to focus on the news. We focus on the newspaper, and now we focus on the broadcast, we focus on the podcast, we focus on the radio. We believe that to be members of a public, we need to be informed about what is going on in the world. And that's true, but it's only partially true. It's not just the news, it's the ability to talk about the news. Here's how we can figure that out. I collect these newspapers. These are newspapers from the United States between maybe 1760 and 1790, right? This is when the United States is starting to establish a democracy, starting to establish the process of ruling ourselves. If you read these newspapers, they're not very good. They would not pass muster with what we think of as journalism today. They are mostly advertising. They are a lot of public opinion. They are people writing essays trying to persuade each other about politics. There is some reporting of what is happening within the government, but not very much. And there's huge amounts of false news. If you look back to this moment in time, there's no journalistic ethics, there's no profession of reporting, and people make things up all the time. So how do we get democracy when it turns out that our news is not very good? And the answer is that we have bad news, but we have very good systems for talking about the news. One of the most famous institutions in the United States around the time of the American Revolution, around the 1770s, is a club in the city of Philadelphia. It's called the Junto. This is not a club for gentlemen. This is a club for tradesmen. 
It's for printers. It's for candle makers. It's for leather tanners. And they get together one night a week, and they say, what news do you have? What have you learned about the world? What have you learned about science? What are the issues affecting our community? It's led by a man named Benjamin Franklin, who's one of the great founders of the United States. And this institution ends up sparking all sorts of political participation. The first university in the United States, in, in Pennsylvania, comes out of this. The first fire company, the first hospital, the first lending library. It comes from this process of taking news about the world, having a conversation about it, and then deciding how one might take action. So here is my argument. My argument is that the truth is important, but it is only part of the equation. In addition to that believable news about the world, we have to have spaces in which we can have a conversation. We have to have spaces in which we can form public opinion and spaces in which we can go on to take action. So here's the bad news. This is the guy who owns our public space for conversation. This is the guy who owns our coffee house and he's an idiot, okay? He is someone who is convinced that he knows how this space should run, but all the actions that he takes make this space harder and harder to participate in. And it is not just Elon Musk's fault, it is our fault for allowing our public sphere to become structured in this way. These are not public spheres. These are private companies run for private purposes. They are run for profit. They are run on a very particular business model which aims to capture our attention and sell it to advertisers. We use them as our public sphere because we don't know where else to go. But it's a terrible decision. It's as if we decided we need to have conversations, we need to govern the city of Leipzig, why don't we have those conversations in Starbucks because the coffee is good, right? That's the equivalent of what we're doing. We're having these conversations in these accidental public spaces, not because it's the right place to do it, but because it's what we had access to. And what we've done is we're giving people like Elon Musk, like Mark Zuckerberg, an enormous amount of power. We give them power over what can be said in these spaces. We give them power over the algorithms that decide what we are likely to see and what we are likely to encounter in these spaces. And over time, what happens is that those conversations get angrier, they get uglier, they get harder and harder to have a constructive conversation because the incentives of those spaces are the incentives of the market, they are not the incentives of the public sphere. Let's talk about how we get public media. Public media, in a very real sense, starts on a particular date. It starts in 1926 in England. England is having a general strike. Everybody is on strike in support of the coal miners who are making less and less money. The newspapers are all on strike. There's no news coming out. One of the very few institutions that is not on strike is this brand new organization called the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation. And the BBC in 1926 does something incredibly rare. They put on the radio the prime minister to talk about what's going on, to talk about the general strike. And this is quite radical, right? We're hearing from a leader directly. We're hearing the voice of the leader in real time. But they also put on leaders of the labor movement, the people who are actually leading the strike. And so what you have on BBC is the establishment of a new kind of entity. It is not in service of the government. It is in service of the public. 
If it was in service of the government, you would only be hearing from the government saying, please end this strike now. It is destroying the nation. But what you have instead is someone who is serving the public and serving public opinion and giving voice to the opposition at the same time. Obviously, public media in Germany has a different history, but an enormous amount of that history traces back to the BBC helping rebuild media in Germany in 1950 around these same models of public interest. Not in the interest of the government, but in the interests of giving people information and giving people a space to make up their minds, to form public opinion. Here's what's happening now. Whatever content we are creating as broadcasters, whatever news, whatever information is out there, we are putting it out on the broadcast airwaves and we are saying, here's what to know about the world. Now you go and have a conversation about it. And where do people go? They go to Facebook, or they go to Twitter, or they go to TikTok. If you think about it, it is a giant subsidy from German taxpayer money sending people over to Silicon Valley companies to have a conversation about the news and information we are creating. And sometimes we do it explicitly. We tell people, go have your conversation there. We have to stop doing this. Mark Zuckerberg doesn't need your money. We don't need a German subsidy for Silicon Valley companies. What we need instead is to figure out how to build our own spaces for this. Here's a friend of mine, Hershon Bogart. He's the head of digital media and research for VPRO uh, in the Netherlands. It's one of their public broadcasters. And he had this realization some years ago that the tools that he had to use to do his work as a public broadcaster were counter to the values of the public broadcaster, right? He had to report his audience to the government so that he continued getting funding. And that meant that he would go out and use Google Analytics, but Google Analytics violates people's privacy, right? It's tracking them in a way that we shouldn't support and shouldn't honor. And he started saying, maybe we could do better with this. Maybe we could look at all of the software, all of the tools that we are using, and try to get an alignment between our mission and the tools that we are using. And along with all the other public broadcasters in the Netherlands, as well as most of the cultural institutions, they started a coalition called Public Spaces. This is something that I would ask you to take a very close look at. Public Spaces is a process that you can use to say, are the tools I'm using in my organization, are they consistent with the values of the organization? And if they are not, can I make a change? Can I use tools that are better in terms of a fit for my values? One of the projects that has come out of public spaces is called PubHubs. PubHubs is a new type of social network. It is a social network not owned by Zuckerberg or Elon Musk or by the Chinese. It's owned by institutions in Dutch society. These are very small social networks. They're designed for a neighborhood association. They're designed for the parents of children in the same class in the same year in school. They're organized for the local football club. And they are owned by those institutions. It is part of what those institutions do in the same way that they maintain a building, in the same way that they offer services, they offer this public space. And the service involved with it is very much like something like Facebook groups or Google groups, but it is owned by and governed by the people who use it. This is what I work on as well. I work on very small social networks with a program called Small Town. And we build these for small communities, villages in the United States to have a space, to have a non-commercial space to talk only about local political issues. These issues are really boring. We talk about this as the world's most boring social network. 
But boring is not a bad thing. Often you want politics, you want civics to be more boring than they currently are. You don't want it always to be scandal and disagreement. You want it to be common ground where people can find a way to work together. These networks are not expensive to run. They cost a few hundred dollars a year. And they are the sort of thing that can make media organizations much stronger. We are building them in our community around community media. We don't really have public media in the United States. We have voluntary media. And these are small nonprofit organizations that are providing media for communities. And this is a way to start moving into digital conversation. If you want people to use these small social networks, you have to do something else. And this is more complicated. You have to build apps that can compete with the apps that we have on our phone. The Twitters, the Facebooks, the Instagrams, these are beautiful and well-designed applications. And they suck our attention all the time. And we can't imagine that people will turn them off. It's not reasonable to ask people to turn them off. What we have to do is build better tools to let people use that existing social media. So we are building a tool right now in my laboratory which lets people use Twitter, lets people use another network called Reddit, as well as this new social network Mastodon, as well as some of these smaller social networks that we're building. And it gives the user much more control than she has right now over social networks. Right now, when you use Twitter, Elon Musk decides who comes up first in your feed. That's the wrong way to do this. You should have the ability to decide who comes up first in your feed. You should be able to look at all of your social networks in one place and have control over how the information reaches you. This is a tool called Gobo. We're going to be releasing this in the next six weeks as a way to start having more control over the social networks. And at the heart of it is this notion that you should be able to choose the algorithm that you use to sort your social media. Rather than having that be an opaque black box that is controlled by a company that you have no control over, you should be able to choose between different algorithms. You should be able to audit them and check them and make sure that they work the way you want them to. So we're building this infrastructure. We're building it around this idea of small platforms that can be controlled by communities a client that is loyal to you as the user that lives on your phone, and a set of algorithms that are open and transparent that people can use to control spam or to combat hate speech. And this is all something that could work within public media. You could imagine public media starting networks in communities. You could imagine having networks for different programs, for documentaries, for different conversations that you want to host. You can imagine a client that someone has on their phone that comes from the public broadcaster, which is a deeply trusted institution, and that that public broadcaster could help you navigate through a world that has a great deal of untruth in it but also help you navigate to healthy conversations. In the world of social media, the EU tends to be known for saying no, right? GDPR, NetsDG, all of these very important regulatory structures that look at what's going on in Silicon Valley and saying, you can't do this. You must protect privacy. You must have increased transparency. This is an incredibly important contribution because the US right now is very bad at saying no to corporations. But what we need coming out of the EU is a positive vision, an affirmative vision. We need to say no to this form of social media, but we need to say yes to public space. We need to have an affirmative vision of what an EU version of online public space could look like. The US is not going to build this. 
We do not believe in public goods in my country. We can't keep our roads up, never mind try to figure out how we could do public broadcasting or public social media. But this is something that the EU might be able to do, and it would be a uniquely European vision, an affirmative vision to come in and say, not only do we need news about the world, but we need healthy public spaces in which we can have these discussions. We are too focused right now on fixing what is wrong with the existing internet. It's not our job to fix what Mark Zuckerberg and others did wrong, but it might be our job to imagine and to build something significantly better. So that's what I came here to say and to share. I'm really excited to talk with anyone who thinks this might be a realistic vision for moving forward with public media and public spaces. I'm at least as interested to talk to people who think I'm crazy and this will never work. But one way or another, I thank you so much for listening to me.